how'd you do? Nice people, fine people, Arabian people, yes, yes, I've met some very nice people, some very, very, very nice people, but you meet the nicest people in your dreams. Uh, if you're looking for a reason why Cabbage Town is unique, I think you, the best place to start is in asking what people think when they move to the city of Atlanta for the first time. You know, people from the north or from other regions of the country who might come down and visit are impressed that even though Atlanta is a major metropolitan area, an urban center, there's a sense that it feels suburban even close to, uh, even within spitting distance, if you will, of downtown. It seems suburban. In fact, uh, one historian wrote that uh, southern metropolitan areas are suburbia. Like with any mill town, um, the central edifice of the mill town is, of course, the mill. It's the reason why workers congregate in the area. It's the source of livelihood. It's the source of a lot of other social services. It's uh, perhaps a source of entertainment and of education, a system that Southern historians have come to call paternalism, uh, meaning that more than just being a modern workplace, uh, the mill was a protector and was a source of all manner of social goods. That's the case of Cabbage Town as well. Certain parts of the Cabbage Town experience are similar to uh, experiences that you might see with uh, northern entrepreneurs. I'm thinking now of the founder of the Cabbage Town Mill, Fulton Bag and Cotton, of course was the name of the mill, uh, dating back to the 1880s. And the founder was a fellow named Jacob Elsus. Jacob Elsus is the stereotypical story of the hard-working immigrant coming to America to seek his claim. Coming from a German family involved in the textile industry since the 18th century, Elsus came to New York where he borrowed train fare to Ohio to meet with his uncle and then traveled to Cartersville, Georgia to set up a trading station. Now, one way in which uh, southern states attempted to attract industry uh, was by boosterism, setting up a broad array of um, enticements for industries to come in from elsewhere. They might be tax incentives, they might be uh, lower water costs, might be sewage service, a whole variety of things, whatever the state could do to, put, to make it a more appealing site. Certainly the state of Georgia attempted to do that with the textile industry, to bring it as much as possible in from, uh, from the uh, other regions of the country, particularly the industrial Midwest and, and uh, the Northeast. You know, Henry Grady, one of the great boosters from the city of Atlanta, for whom so many civic institutions in the city of Atlanta are named at this point, uh, did as good a job of anybody explaining how the South may have lost the Civil War, but they were going to win the peace by attracting major components of northern industry. 
One of the main reasons, you know, I'm not a military historian, but one of the main reasons uh, that some military historians say that the South lost the war was by not having an industrial infrastructure. And so it was on the minds of boosters in, in almost every state to try and attract some industry to their state. Well, in the case of the textile industry, uh, that meant drawing an extant industry, an existing industry, from Rhode Island or Massachusetts. Uh, and in an ironic sense, some of those northeastern states were themselves lending a helping hand toward moving those industries elsewhere, a step perhaps they would regret in coming years. Um, for example, in order to punish the South, a group of uh, northeastern senators right after the Civil War uh, passed a particular tax code which said that um, exports of raw materials, cotton for example, cotton once ginned or cotton maybe freshly picked, but raw materials would pay a special export tax, whereas exporters of finished products would not pay an export tax. Now the thought was that the South had a, uh, fields and fields of cotton but did not have um, adequate industrial capacity, and so this tax would automatically favor industry that already existed in the Northeast. But what it really did was turn the corner for the South and create an economic incentive to establish that self-same industry in the South. Because if you're going to get taxed if you send your raw materials out of the country, then you have an incentive to develop the final industrial processing stage, to make those coarse goods, to make clothing and apparel, uh, to spin yarn. You have the incentive to go the extra step and finish the product yourself. Sometime after his move to Ohio and his subsequent experience in the dry goods trade, Jacob Elsus moved to Cartersville, Georgia, where he opened a trading station. Then, in 1868, he decided to move operations to Atlanta to gain access to a greater market. It was at this point that Elsus made the switch from retail to wholesale trade, opening the Southern Bag Company. This was eventually reorganized into the Fulton Cotton Spinning Company, and finally expanded again to be known as the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mills, as it was named until 1957. One of the main reasons to move to the South, though, was a supply of cheap labor. And you know, that's really ironic, isn't it? Because what kept the South dependent on uh, agrarian economic traditions was their supply of, shall we say, very cheap labor before the, the Civil War, i.e. the institution of slavery. But now, uh, as the working classes had begun to develop in the Northeast and in other uh, areas of the country, despite the disappearance of the institution of slavery, there were still vast groups of largely agrarian workers who had no particular manufacturing or industrial skills who made uh, a, a wage labor pool that was still much less expensive than comparable wage labor in the Northeast. So that's another reason, even independent of boosterism, that, uh, that uh, entrepreneurs would come to the region. In the case of the Cabbage Town Mill, Fulton Bag and Cotton, um, we have an interesting case. One of the reasons that uh, southern entrepreneurs would locate their mills in smaller towns is because the smaller town workforces, largely agrarian, were not used to high paychecks. In fact, uh, sharecropping is not a lucrative profession. Uh, sharecropping was a way to uh, keep people tied to the land, very little money, almost subsistence. So if you could capitalize on that kind of a labor pool, you'd have an inexpensive labor pool. Which makes Elsus's decision to move inside of Atlanta, Georgia, somewhat uh, of an anomaly. How would Elsus uh, gain access to an inexpensive labor pool that his, um, his contemporaries were benefiting from? His uh, answer was very simple. He imported it. He brought it in from the hills of North Georgia, Appalachian Whites, a homogeneous community of Appalachian whites brought in from the hills of North Georgia. Brought in, taught very uh, menial skills, uh, taught how to operate the, the machinery, uh, taught how to make a mill town run. The people of Cabbage Town are the very substance that differentiates this mill town 
from all others of its kind. The North Georgia Appalachians have a unique perspective with a tight-knit social structure as well as a strong allegiance to the land, both of which they brought with them and which still persist today within this urban environment. The tightly knit community contributed to the unsuccessful attempts by outsiders to unionize the mill, and this same closeness of community has kept many of the Cabbage Town descendants right where they are, preserving a rich heritage. And that makes Cabbage Town not only of interesting historical significance, but also of sociological significance. Because consider, as the city of Atlanta became more and more heterogeneous, different groups, typical metropolitan area development, different ethnic groups, different racial groups, a high degree of mixing occurred in the city of Atlanta. There was an economic incentive to keep the mill town at Cabbage Town homogenous, Appalachian whites, generation after generation after generation of Appalachian whites. The city became sophisticated, but the mill town population stayed regressive, stayed in place, didn't move forward as the city of Atlanta moved forward. Given the unique makeup of this particular mill within a city and employing the North Georgia Appalachians, another situation, unlike any other, was born. During the times of economic hardship, the women and children were compelled to work in the mill alongside the men. This created several factors that together form the intricate fabric that makes up present-day Cabbage Town. For example, the significance of child labor laws. Children are made to work, therefore foregoing educational opportunities, resulting in their further indenturement to the mill. Also, women's rights are for the most part non-existent. And all social life and gatherings are centered around the workplace, contributing to the mill's inextricable involvement in their lives. Finally, the granny system, where small children whose parents both work in the mill are raised by their grandmothers, creating a culture based on deep-seated respect for the elderly and tradition. This reinforces a tendency to cling to and preserve the primitive ways surrounding the mill long after its demise. When we sit back from our perspective here in the, the, the vaunted 1990s with all of our um, political and social advancements and, and this and that, it's uh, tempting to think that principles like uh, feminism, equal rights for women, uh, are something that were somehow uh, just born in our own frame of reference uh, that, that are not historical phenomena. Well, necessity drives a lot of social change. And uh, in Cabbage Town, you're dealing with uh, an inherently conservative group, an insular group, an inward-looking group of workers, and yet we find um, some of the real basis for employment feminism. Consider the following. Um, at Cabbage Town, men and women worked together. They worked for a similar wage structure, which is not to say that men weren't paid more, but just that the difference wasn't that astounding given how poorly everyone was paid. Uh, in addition, think about it. If the man and the woman are out of the workplace, uh, what happens to the kids? You know, what, where, during the day, uh, what happens? In fact, there's an amusing story that's told that one of the reasons why Cabbage Town acquired that name, Cabbage Town, is because uh, the women worked side by side with the men in the mills. And I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the way in which cabbage is, uh, is cooked, but it's one of the few vegetables that you can literally boil all day long. Uh, and it just gets mushier and mushier and mushier, which for some reason seems to be the desired objective in cooking cabbage. So uh, when visitors would uh, go by the mill housing in the, uh, in the area, they would often smell cabbages cooking because they'd cook all day. Yeah, this is a vegetable you can put on in the morning, come back, uh, come back home later, and it, and it would be ready. Um, but women learned uh, to, uh, to deal with a lot of the uh, uh, vulgarities of the workplace, a lot of the insensitivities of the workplace. Uh, Effie Dodd, one of the workers in Cabbage Town who uh, gave a delightful oral history, uh, observed that, you know, the sensibilities were gone. Uh, she said, you know, if a man needed to wee, he wee. That's what she said. Uh, and, and you think about it, the South was known for this sort of genteel approach, protective approach. 
But in a, in a mill community, uh, a lot of those protections have to go by the wayside, and particularly one where labor is not quite as plentiful, where labor has to actually be imported. The best, uh, both men and women, have to, uh, have to pull their weight. In fact, children have to pull their weight too, uh, which is an unfortunate side of Cabbage Town before child labor protection uh, was enacted as federal legislation and the state legislation. You know, children worked in the mill as well. But it created a sense of a community, uh, an important sense of community. The mill also provided educational opportunities uh, for those children, probably uh, not as, not as uh, up to date as educational opportunities might have been elsewhere, but, but provided it nonetheless. You know, you're dealing with a homogeneous community, a lot of distractions out there in Atlanta, but these are people who, uh, who don't integrate with Atlanta, who stay insular. What do you do for entertainment in a situation like that? As with many mill towns, past and present, entire communities become dependent upon these businesses for every element of their existence. Housing, groceries, and so forth, either sponsored, subsidized, or outright owned by the mill, would help keep control, and as one person wrote, keep the mill's money in the mill's pocket. In one instance, when a theater opened in downtown Atlanta, the mill bought and converted a church to provide entertainment for the workers. While providing for the basic needs of the mill workers, this paternalism on the part of the mill established and fostered a dependence that ultimately contributed to economic disaster when the mill closed. 1954. The Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill is sold, and this represents the beginning of the end for the business and begins the decline of the community as well. Severe problems arise when the mill stops providing the services the people have always expected of them. The paternal mill leaves, and nothing, and no one, steps in to replace the loss. You know, one of the interesting side effects of having a homogenous labor group like we have at Cabbage Town is that some of the traits that a group like that will bring into a new situation transfer very directly. Hard work, um, not, a, not, partic not any particular opposition to more menial tasks. Those transfer very directly from the agrarian lifestyle to this new urban milieu they found themselves in. But some transfer in ways that I, I don't think that uh, the, uh, the management that hired the workers could have ever anticipated. If we think about some of our stereotypical impressions of, uh, of, of a Appalachian communities, we think of something called the land ethic. Uh, this is my mountain, my family has lived on this mountain, we will not be moved. Uh, it's a, it's a, a tradition, a stereotype, to a certain extent a myth, that has uh, been reiterated over and over and over again. But how does such a stereotype translate to an urban milieu? I mean, can you imagine coming home to your apartment building and, at one t uh, and for some reason having developed a sense of land ethic associated with your apartment building? This is my high rise, I shall not be moved. I mean, it doesn't make much sense to us today thinking about it, particularly in an urban context. But yet, there are elements of that that uh, are present in the culture of Cabbage Town. Why, as the city of Atlanta became economically robust, as it grew over time, became an interesting and diverting area, but Cabbage Town stayed the same, why would people stay? Could we say it's the only thing they knew? that would be patently wrong. Uh, they were exposed to the mass media uh, as everyone else was. So why did the workers stay generation after generation? What, what was going on there? While mills were falling by the wayside, needing to make technical improvements, uh, becoming uneconomic to operate, here was a mill who was uh, acquiring contracts to make tarps for World War I, for World War II for the Korean War. And just as the market for these goods would evaporate, it just so happened the United States would go to war again, and it would be time to restock and resupply tarps. So other mill towns were having to diversify. Other mill towns were closing down, and those workers were going back to an array of other industries, or were having their trial by fire, going through their periods of intense poverty. But not so at Cabbage Town. Here, the homogenous workforce that had stayed with that mill year after year after year again was making just enough to stay profitable and making just enough to stay attached to the mill. That's the way that Cabbage Town stayed 
almost an unchanged island, uh, uh, an, an industrial anachronism, all the way to 1970 when the mill finally closed. Now, I'm not suggesting that the good, the, the market for these goods didn't fall off over time. It, cer it certainly did, but, uh, but, to, but to think of it, to have the, the main employer in this area be the same from 1886 to 1970, what kind of skills do those workers take with them when the mill closes in 1970? And that, that really is one of the saddest chapters in Cabbage Town's history, you know. What happened post-mill? There are other factors at work. Crime, drugs, and prostitution, which have settled in the area since the early 70s, have given the residents their only livelihood since the mill has been closed. When the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill finally closed down, the area was, in de was a pocket of desperate poverty. Why didn't people move on? Well, they did. They did. To a large extent, economic uh, incentives drive the train. People did leave. But still, a kernel of community at Cabbage Town. Part of that reason, the land ethic, associating themselves with that ethic. You can prepare for something day after day after day, uh, but when it finally hits, something like that, uh, a real turning point, it's, it's difficult to come to grips with. Cabbage Town, again, shows uh, that the two sides of the coin can be very, very different. On the one hand, Many people in Atlanta perceive of Cabbage Town as a, an area that is culturally homogenous, folk crafts, uh, quaint in a sense. The architecture is, is older. Um, the citizens are, are examples of Appalachiana. And it's, it's, it's chic to look at Cabbage Town. It's, it's chic to think of it as this, this island of another culture. Cabbage Town is rich with cultural tradition. Stemming from the North Georgia Appalachian heritage, the people of Cabbage Town maintain the traditions of their forefathers. From the so-called storyteller of Cabbage Town, Horace Carson, to the play Cabbage Town Three Women, there is evidence of these people's Appalachian roots. The other side of the coin is far more desperate. We're dealing with economic realities here. There is no engine for growth in the area. And so particularly in the 1970s, we see a lot of Cabbage Town citizens unfortunately turning to crime and a vast array of crime, trafficking in stolen products and even uh, prostitution, even child prostitution. Um, we see an increase in vandalism. One of the most historic uh, cemeteries in the Atlanta area is located just adjacent to Cabbage Town, and we see uh, uh, gravestones turned over, we see graffiti, um, and a lot of this is associated, a lot of this is our indications, frankly, of, of desperate people, economic desperation. One of the real challenges for Atlanta will be how to reinvigorate the economy of that once thriving industrial area. You know, there was a time prior to the Great Depression when the Cabbage Town area was not just a place for workers who worked in the mill, but also had its own local uh, economic base. It had uh, 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 dry goods stores, it had uh, cleaners, it had um, movie theaters, it had uh, general stores. And the, the challenge will be how to restore that base without engaging in what urban sociologists today refer to as gentrification. Uh, Prettification, if you will, Disneyfication. How are we going to how are we going to solve that problem? You know, one uh, one tremendous problem is if you make Cabbage Town livable by the standards of Atlanta's first citizens, then what happens to the few remaining Cabbage Towners? Presently, Cabbage Town is at a juncture. Cabbage Town is experiencing some gentrification, in which a higher income population seeking to retreat from the suburbs back to an in-town location, buys up properties in lower income areas, raising the property value and creating a renewed, revitalized community. This has been witnessed in Atlanta in areas such as Morningside, Virginia Highlands, and more recently, Grant Park and Candler Park. While this has a positive impact, at least cosmetically and potentially economically to those areas, what of the people of Cabbage Town and the descendants of those first mill workers that came to work for Jacob Elsus at the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill? 
See, space is a problem there. We're talking about prime property that were it not for this mill would have been developed into a variety of uh, industrial enterprises, literally in the shadow of downtown. So space was a concern. The so-called factory lot was the uh, central portion of uh, the residential community. These were a series of multifamily units, some of which are still standing today. Uh, they look quite dilapidated today. In, in their time, they were fairly standard. We might think of them as similar to tenement housing we'd see in the east, but not similar to the type of mill housing we'd see elsewhere in the south. Now, outside of the factory lot, and by the way, at no time did all of the workers live in the factory lot. It was always a minority of workers. Single workers would live in the factory lot in, in multi-family dwellings. Outside of that were houses, uh, houses that were in prairie, uh, sort of prairie style, maybe uh, single story, some two story houses, very attractive uh, by their, by t even by today's standards, which is uh, one alarming thing because some of those attractive looking houses um, could be gentrified quite nicely and made quite unaffordable for the people that now live in them. The Olympics are coming to Atlanta in 1996. What will this mega infusion of construction and renewed energies for cleanup of the downtown areas mean for the dilapidated buildings and jobless community of Cabbage Town? There have been some proposals for creating a new rail hub in the community, as well as a historical museum and shop community, ironically similar to the counterparts popular in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina, where these people came from in the beginning. You know, it's not just the land ethic that's kept people in Cabbage Town. It's not just a, a desire to stay in a familiar environment. It's more than that. There's a real pride in Appalachian communities. It exists today in indigenous Appalachian communities, North Georgia, Tennessee, the Smoky Mountains. You'll see it in all of these small towns and communities. So the real challenge is, how do we preserve some of that pride in community? And how can we do that? How can we provide economic security, how can we give people jobs? How can we keep housing affordable and still maintain some of that pride in community? That's the real challenge for Cabbage Town. For a videotape, this is tomorrowpictures.tv.